Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 53, Writing Historicals Set in World War II, an interview with Sarah Sundin, coming to you on Thursday, April 19th, 2018. Now, I just finished reading Sarah's uh, newest book, The Sea Before Us, that just came out, I think, uh, near the beginning of February. It is the first book in a new series called Sunrise at Normandy. Now, I was pretty worried about starting a, se- a book let alone a series, set in World War II, because that's never really been uh, an appealing time period to me. There's just nothing about it that has really drawn me in. And I was a little worried because here I was going to interview this woman and she's got several series set in World War II. What if I don't like her books? But I have to say that there was so many interesting things going on with the characters. I couldn't stop reading. Uh, a three-hour visit at the DMV felt like 15 minutes, thanks to Sarah. And that is quite a high acclaim for any book, isn't it? <laughs> and then after, um, you know, using my airplane napkin during the last 45 minutes of the of the book in the middle of this full plane of people, dabbing at my eyes so much for what was going on that the napkin was soaked. The next thing I did was turn the page to find out what happens in the first part of book two. So that is my plug for how much I think that you should try some of Sarah's books. And I think you're really going to enjoy the interview with her. She's got some fun stories. She's done some really interesting things for research. And she's just an altogether interesting and fun person to talk to. I hope you enjoy the interview. And if it helps you to uh, figure out what sorts of research that you want to do, and keep in mind that Sarah has done so much research during the World War II time period that you may find her blog to be of interest to you as its own research for, for things that you're trying to do in your writing. So I hope you find it fun. And here we go with the show. Hello, today's guest is historical author Sarah Sundin. Although Sarah came from a home wallpapered in books, she only briefly envisions herself as a writer when she and her sister co-wrote Funny Dancing Fruits and Vegetables, complete with crayon illustrations. Then she discovered science and earned her doctorate in pharmacy. In January 2000, she woke from a dream so intriguing she had to write it down. She proceeded to write a really bad 750-page contemporary Christian romance. That book will never be published. But it did lead her to join a critique group, attend writers' conferences, and join American Christian Fiction Writers. In 2011, she received the Writer of the Year Award at the Mount Hermon Christian Writers' Conference. When she's not writing, she works as an on-call hospital pharmacist and teaches Sunday school and women's Bible studies. She enjoys speaking to school, community, women's historical, and church groups. Oh, and she also had the privilege of flying in a B-17 flying fortress. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me, Kitty. I'm so glad you're here. It turns out we have uh, friends in common, so that's always a fun way to get to know new people. It is. And the friend that we have in common actually is my editor and friend, Marcy, and she is always talking about Sarah and her fabulous books and how wonderful they are. So I thought, I really do need to have you come on and talk about writing historical fiction with us. Well, thank you. Marcy Weidemuller is such an inspiration to me, and she's my editor too, so I love her. <laughs> nice, excellent. Well, listen, um, you have so many interesting things in your bio. And I was it was hard for me to have to you know chop some of it down for time, but um, tell us a little bit about how you got started. Did you grow up listening to family stories of World War II? I did. I um, my grandfather was he served in the Navy during World War II. He was a pharmacist mate, which was a medic. And he was a storyteller. I found now that most World War II veterans came home and they did not tell their stories. That was their way of dealing with the horrors they'd seen. But that wasn't how my grandfather worked. He processed by talking and by telling stories. And he was a funny man. He told great jokes. But so he would tell the funny stories and he would also tell the harrowing stories. And um, so I heard those. I also heard, um, because they lived in Ohio, we lived in California, but my parents told their stories. So my mom was always telling um, stories about how her mother dealt with rationing and problems on the home front. So I grew up hearing these stories. And my great uncle, my my grandfather's brother, was a um, B-17 bomber pilot. 
and he flew into Pearl Harbor during the attack. Wow. So yeah, he was shot at. It was quite a story. So and he he had other great stories too. But so I grew up with I grew up around storytellers and so I think World War II kind of seeped into my soul and my dad was always watching documentaries and victory at sea and things like that. So um, at the time I thought it was boring, but I it did it did create a love for that era in me. And when I started writing, I first wrote two contemporary novels and then I had the story idea that would only work in a historical setting. And so I automatically picked World War II. And I, ironically, I thought, oh, this, it's going to be the easiest time period to write about because it wasn't that long ago and there's still people living. And my, my, at that time, my grandmother was still alive. Actually, two of my grandmothers were still alive. And so I thought, oh, yeah, easy. Um, thank goodness I did not know how much work I would have to do on research or I would never have started. <laughs> Doing the research, I fell in love with the era and that has driven me since. Wow. Okay. That's really interesting because I have to say that um, I had some of those stories. Most of my relatives that were alive and, and telling stories about that era, uh, era were pretty much people who um, had gotten some sort of a, um, gosh, you know what the word is, but like a, a permission to not go because what they were doing had to be done here. Deferment. Yes. Deferment. Yes. Yes. Um, and so I would hear the stories, like you said, uh, of the, um, the, the things that they would go out and my mom went out and picked um, the, the cotton from the, uh, I want to say that, gosh, I've already just forgotten what the name of this plant is because I've been out of Michigan so long. The, the brown, sorry? Milkweed. It's like milkweed. Yeah. Um, it's called like uh, cattails. I think we called them cattails, but I think it's part of the milkweed family. Yeah. So, um, you know, I heard, I heard similar stories, but somehow I never got interested enough. So when I, you know, was talking to you about uh, bringing you on and, you know, it was historical and it didn't really occur to me it was World War II. And then I got the book and I thought, oh boy, I don't really like World War II. What am I going to do if I don't like this book? But then I sent you an email saying, well, I just got through three hours at the DMV, which felt like 15 minutes because of your book. And then I just like took an around the country trip saying goodbye to family, which didn't feel very long because I, I was like reading your book. And then, you know, I'm taking the little napkin they give you with the Coca-Cola on the plane. And, and I'm just, and I'm wiping my eyes so much. The napkin is sopping wet. I'm like, okay, this is a really good book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, um, tell us to make sure I don't get the, the name wrong. This is your newest book, and it is called? It is called The Sea Before Us. Yay, I had that in my head, but I'm like, I might be thinking of the wrong title because you have three brothers, and there'll be three titles, right? Yes, yes. and it's the first book in the um, Sunrise at Normandy series. Okay, well, tell us a little bit about this, and also tell us um, a little bit about, like, you have several series, and I think they're, most of them are trilogies, or all of them are in World War II. Can you just kind of tell us, like, how did you come up with so many stories in this period? Well, once I get started, I couldn't stop. So um, this is actually the start of my fourth series. Uh, my first one, it was loosely based on I'm, my great, great uncle, who's a B-17 bomber pilot, and when I had my very first World War II story idea, I pictured him as a pilot. And then I saw a documentary on the B-17s, and I thought, oh, that's right. Uncle Rod was a B-17 pilot. So I thought, oh, perfect. And um, so that's I set my first series as three B-17 bomber pilots who are brothers, and they're based in England with the U.S. 8th Air Force and conducting these bombing raids over, um, over Nazi-occupied Europe. And, of course, each one is a love story. So most of the women were home front, U.S. home front, but there was one who was a, an American nurse in, in England. And then doing the research for that, I learned about the nursing. And out of that came the Wings of the Nightingale series, which followed three American flight nurses. And I had them based in, in the Mediterranean theater. So from North Africa to Sicily to Italy to southern France. So, you know, just beautiful settings. And that was great fun to write. And wow. during my general research, I kept reading about the Navy, and my friends were saying, well, why don't you write, your grandfather was in the Navy, write a Navy series. So I wrote the Waves of Freedom series, which was three naval officers 
And that has to do with the Battle of the Atlantic when the American and the British ships were trying to get the convoys across to Britain with all the war material and men and food that Britain needed so desperately. And the U-boats were sinking ships. So that was based on that. And then it's based in Boston. So I had some home front mysteries for my heroines, which was a lot of fun. And out of that research came <laughs> my new series that I really wanted to set um, do with D-Day. And as I was doing the research for Waves of Freedom, I kept reading about the U.S. naval involvement on D-Day. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. That's a story that hasn't been told. And I had all the, the um, Air Force research for the first series. And I thought, well, I never told a fighter pilot. Wouldn't it be great to have a fighter pilot over Normandy on D-Day? And then I could have a soldier. And I thought, well, I could tell D-Day from the sea, the air, and the land. And if they're three brothers. And I had a, a, a narrative problem because most of my series are sequential. So book one, book two, book three. And this would be three stories in parallel at the same time. And well, how do I work that out so I don't, brother one doesn't know what brother two is doing. And, and so I have the brothers, they're estranged. And therefore, brother two doesn't know what brother one is doing. So I was able to tell all three stories in parallel. And it's been great fun because um, it also has an overarching theme for the whole story, for the whole series of forgiveness and reconciliation. And how do you, how do you forgive yourself when you've done something unforgivable? And then likewise, how do you forgive someone who has betrayed you? And you know, especially when it's somebody who thought loved you and you loved dearly. So I've been able to explore those themes in the whole series while telling each story individually. So it's, it was, it's been a fun series to write. You know, I, I have to say, I really enjoyed how you had a very believable, um, you know, and as a writer, I have to say a very believable plot problem <laughs> uh, for the hero and an equally believable and totally different plot problem for the heroine. And then set in this era where, um, you know, maybe if I'd paid more attention to my history, I would have known what was going to happen at all these places. But I mean, you know, in general, I knew, but a lot of times I was like, holy cow, that's terrible. I had no idea something like that happened, like one of the exercises that happened right before they went to the beaches and stuff. Um, so it was just really interesting the way that, you, <clears throat> pardon me, that you brought everything together. And it made me wonder, again, from a writing standpoint, when you realized that the three brothers would need to be estranged in order to tell three parallel stories, did you have to go back and come up with an estrangement? Oh, tell us about that. Um, that was interesting because I had to come up with something that would um, break all three brothers apart. And actually, this is sequential because um, reading book one, you find out why Wyatt is estranged from Adler and Clay. But it's not till you read Adler's story in book two, The Sky Above Us, that you realize that why Adler and Clay are estranged from each other, too. There's something else that happened that night. So it was really... Um, I, I'm telling my friends it's kind of like a Shakespearean melodrama in this family that just kind of unfolds. And, and of course, it starts with a woman. Often, these things often do. And right. um, you've got young men with too much testosterone on their hands. And, you know, these, you know, these great tragedies. I mean, here's started off with a, an accident that turned into a tragedy that turned into, you know, this, this downward spiral that just shatters this family. And, and here's a loving family, but... The, there's always been an undercurrent of jealousy, as there often are between siblings who are pitted against each other. And um, they had a father who kind of believed that pitting them against each other was you know, good, will make them men. And so they come from this background, and then when these things happen, they, they, you know, the family's just shattered. And you know, I've seen families broken up over smaller things than this, and um, which is you know, just, just so sad. But I, it really helped me explore these issues of a family and what do you do when a family member has betrayed your you when you violate your own principles and betray a family member and um yeah that was kind of fun fun to do in a, in a horrible way yeah <laughs> i'm going to shatter this family <laughs> well you did a really good job <laughs> I, and that was all in the prologue <laughs> i've or a good react reaction to that prologue is, is you know, seven pages of of um, of tragedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh wow. So um, 
For listeners who are either writing historical or are leaning towards writing historical, what, are you, what do you think are some of the things that would be helpful tips or pitfalls to avoid? Oh, there's so many. Um, I actually <laughs> Great. Do, do teach a whole um, workshop on how to do you know, the concepts of historical research and how to do it. There are a lot of um, pitfalls to watch out for. Um, what I keep in mind, first and foremost, is that for my reader, this might be their first and only introduction to World War II. So I take that as a solemn responsibility. I want to get the details right because I have read bad history and fiction and have people quote it like, well, this is what happened. Like, um, no, that's what happened in that novel. It didn't happen in real life. And so I have to be very careful um, that I'm very respectful, not just to the, you know, to history and the era, but it, more importantly, it's respectful to the people who lived through that era. And I really want to make sure their stories are preserved accurately. And I don't write about historical figures. I have fictional characters in historical events, but I try to portray those as accurately as I can out of respect. Um, and also, accuracy is very important. And I think that accuracy, historical accuracy in fiction has has really risen and we're seeing so much excellent historical fiction that you just can't get away with sloppy research anymore. And which I'm very thankful for. And I think the standards have risen. And so you do have to, you have to, I tell people, if you don't like research, do not write historical fiction. You have to love research. You have to love research enough that you have to tell yourself, I need to stop and get back to this. Yeah. There's always this push pull of the story drives the research, but you love the research too and knowing when to pull back and um, also um, when to stop. And, <laughs> and I have to, I tell writers of historical fiction, they, they say, I have so much wonderful information and I know it's too much for my readers. And I say, go ahead and put it in your rough draft. I give you permission to dump it all in your rough draft. And then in the edits, you're going to slash it out. In your rough draft, you write in everything you think the reader needs to know. In the edit, you only put in what the reader actually needs to know to understand the story. Um, I probably err too much toward too much research for, versus not enough. Um, and I'm always edit, I'm always slashing, and then my editor slashes some more, and then the copy <laughs> slashes more. And probably should do some more slashing but um but that general principle of um and i say say save, save the best bits and i write blog posts out of them i put them as um frequently asked questions on my website i um i can make um i do blog series when my books come out and i'll write um you know things about the history behind it so i can use that information but not in the story. So there's that knowing when to pull back. Right. So the, the, you're taking the pieces that you cut out of the first draft, and that's the basis for some of the blog posts and stuff. Exactly. So That's brilliant. When you're talking about the training exercise, the exercise tiger is slapped in sands. I did not write a blog post about that, but I could have because I, you know, I covered it from his point of view in the story, but obviously he doesn't know everything. The, my hero, why does not know everything that's going on. So I could have written a complete blog post about that. I did include information in the reader letter at the end, some of the, the details about um, the disaster at Slapton Sands. But I couldn't have put that, I could not put it all in the novel. Because first of all, I have to be straight, stay, stay true to his point of view. What does he know? What does he not know? And I have to be mindful of the reader and how much he or she really wants to read. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's so interesting. Okay, so then from the other perspective, or another perspective, um, I know that you're a Christian and I'm a Christian. You're writing actually for Christian readers who are buying Christian books published by Christian publishers. Um, I found that apparently uh, for lack of a better way to say it, and I'm saying it with, with grace and humility and um, mercy on all sides, uh, apparently I'm just not conservative enough to write Christian fiction for a Christian audience. But tell us a little bit about how you, at some point, you, you learned about the different kinds of um, 
um, genres and you made a decision which direction you wanted to go. Can you tell us a little bit about how that decision came about? Well, I think partly because the stories, I, first of all, the stories I want to tell, I want to tell clean. I don't want to use cuss words. I don't want to write sex scenes. And people often say that the Christian market is too restrictive, but in a way, the, the secular market can be just as restrictive in the opposite direction. You are forced to put in sex scenes. You're forced to put in cuss words. And for the writer who doesn't want to write, go there, um, you're forced to write what you don't want to write. And also right. forced to remove everything spiritual, pretty much. Yeah. If I'm writing about Buddhism or Hinduism or something like that, fine, go for it. But because I'm writing about Christianity, that's actually censored in the, the secular market. And, um, you know, that's their choice to make. That's what sells for them. But for me, I can't imagine writing a story without God in it because God is so present in my life. And that's part of, you know, my worldview, how I, how I view the world. I see God as an active participant with me in my life. And, all my characters have problems, as characters should, and the only real way for them to find healing and completeness is through their relationship with God. And for me to strip that out would be ripping off an arm. Yeah. So, Takes the heart out of your story from you. The Christian market. So, I mean, I, I, can't, I could, but it would be, ugh, I don't know how I do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally understand because I'm in that rock and a hard place place. Yeah. And um, yeah, you just have to decide, am I going to go this direction, this direction, or try to make my path through the middle? And nowadays with um, independent publishing, a lot of authors have found that middle road where they can, they can write the clean they want um, or they can, or they can write what we call edgy fiction. They can have some of the Christian message in there, but have some of the, the more worldly aspects in it too and write for their audience, write the stories that are put on their heart and stay true to their perspective without writing for, you know, one, the, the extreme of the Christian market or the extreme of the, the pure secular market. So nowadays we have a lot more freedom as with independent publishing being a true option. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's one of the things that I like about it. It, it's, um, it's harder in just a different way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, I am a total neuroscience geek, and in your bio, you talk about, and then you discovered science and got a doctorate in the scientific field. So tell me, I, I'm just really interested, like, where, um, where have you found that your passion for science has intersected with some of your writing, whether it's research or tell us some stories, if you like. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I've been bachelor's in chemistry and then got my doctorate in pharmacy. So I've had a lot of healthcare related heroes and heroines. I've had um, four nurses and two pharmacists, which is, I'm, I'm joking. I used to joke that there have been no pharmacist heroes in novels because it's a super boring profession. And I think that as a pharmacist, we are a boring profession. We choose pharmacy because it is boring. <laughs> it's a quiet profession. You don't touch bodily fluids. It's, it's lovely. <laughs> oh, oh, I was working in a pharmacy last, last Friday, and I work in a hospital pharmacy, and a nurse came to the door, and she, she holds out this tube with some fluids, and she says, I have that specimen for you. And I screamed, I said, not for me, please. <laughs> she says, why not? This is pharmacy. This is a lab. I don't touch fluids. <laughs> so, but... <laughs> That was a rabbit trail. No, I totally understand. I was in nursing school for a whole 10 days before I realized that my love of hugging people is not the same of my distaste for touching other things of people. <laughs> so anyway, but so I have written two pharmacists, a hero and a heroine. And also my scientific training has come in in very strange ways because the Navy is very technical. And also when I was writing my books about the pilots, because I had to understand how the, I realized what actually held me back for a bit was realize at first I was going to tell my very first novel from the perspective of my heroine and have his stories come through letters as a pilot and realized with censorship, I wasn't able to tell as much of his story as I wanted to because he couldn't write the details of what he was going through. 
But then I realized if I wrote from his point of view, I had to be behind the wheel of a B-17. And that meant I had to know how a B-17 worked. I had to know basically how to fly a plane, which I don't know how to do and I never want to do. And it's a very technical field. And so I had to read B-17 flying manuals and I had to read um, you know, pilot's manuals and I had to watch the Army Air Force training film for how to fly B-17. And my chemistry and physics training kicked in and I was able to understand that. And same with, um, you know, in the sea before us, the, the hero is a destroyer gunnery officer. So he has to understand how the guns work. I read the U.S. Navy's Naval Ordnance and Gunnery Manual from 1945, 500 pages of nastiness. Oh. And it was super boring, but, well, interesting in my science nerdy way, but I understand enough of it because I had taken a full year of college physics and so I was able to understand it enough so that I could understand what my hero was doing and so I could hopefully translate what he was doing onto the page for my lay reader. So, you know, I, I when I first started writing I thought, well, I'm not I'm not qualified to be a writer because I wasn't an English major and everybody's an English major and you have to be to be a novelist and first of all I re quickly realized that most published novelists are not English majors in fact sometimes being an English major is a hindrance because they're so busy trying to write beautiful lofty thoughts that they can't get the book finished or they can't write um, commercial fiction they right busy trying to write literary fiction then they can't write something um, you know for normal people <laughs> right <laughs> Uh, but I know people who are lawyers, physicians, nurses, um, a geologist, I mean, all sorts of, and stay at home moms with, with no college degrees and realized I did fit in. And my detour through science actually led me to the types of stories that I could write. And I'm not saying I'm the only one who could write it, but my scientific training allowed me to write stories that most people wouldn't be able to write. So it was the right path for me. Right, right. You just kind of found your niche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Oh, my goodness. That's wonderful. Now, have you had any moments when you were wanting to bang your head against the wall and ask yourself, why in the world have you done this? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Um, you know, sometimes they even reach research dead ends where you just cannot find the information you need. It just drives you bonkers. Or when there's too much information, you're just trying to process it all. Um, plotting for me is a great, oh, I call it a match, um, trying to fit historical events and my story events and trying to make them fit and eat the proper story structure so that it, so that it reads well for the reader that can feel like a total wrestling match. Um, so there are many, many times I bang my head. <laughs> yeah. The love of story just drives me forward. So. Oh, that is wonderful. Now, so, so your first book you co-wrote with your sister long ago when you were using crayons. Does your sister do any writing or does she read your books? Or? She should. She's actually a better writer than I am. She always was. So um, she, she writes beautifully. She is very clever and witty and um, she really should. Um, so I know she does, she's done a little bit of blogging. She should do more. Uh, <laughs> this is the big sister talking. <laughs> yeah. All right, Sarah's sister, we're waiting for you to write something for us to read. <laughs> write truly great novels. I think she should write, she could write really beautiful, like women's fiction, where you have these really great deep stories. I think that's the type of writing she would just, I think it would just be lovely novels. Oh, nice. Now, what do you call your books? When I was reading it, I was trying to decide, you know, it, it, it's got so much um, human, emotional, relational element that I wondered if it was women's fiction, but obviously it's historical. So what do you call them or what does Ravel call them? Um, technically, it's historical romance. Um, when I'm speaking within the Christian market, I say historical romance because the definition of Historical fiction versus historical romance is if you remove the romance from the story, do you still have a story? In my case, the answer is no. My romance is 
the primary plot line driving the story is like, will they or will they not get together? Um, with the war story and going along in parallel. But when I'm speaking, I often say historical fiction because when you say romance, people think of bodice rippers and um, my bodices always stay neatly buttoned because I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I use romance um, very carefully, and or sometimes I'll say love stories set during World War II. Right, yeah, because then people don't have that other expectation. Exactly. So, like, if I'm at a book signing and people ask, "Oh, what are these?" and I'll say, well, "I write love stories set during World War II," and then they're like, "Okay, got it." So, if they don't like love stories, because sometimes men will pick. I've had, actually have a lot of male readers because they like the history. And I found, I thought all men were like my husband. And my husband doesn't like romance at all. Um, and I assumed all men were like that. But I've since learned there are men who sit on the couch and watch Pride and Prejudice with their wives and enjoy it. And <laughs> man, we're not talking, you know, fru fru These are manly men. And I have a, one of my, my, um, one of our good friends is an ex-Marine. He served in Vietnam. I mean, and he was a butcher in real life. I mean, this is a man's man. He loves my books. Oh, nice. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> yeah. I've also been surprised when I find out that, that there are some men who read my books because my husband also is like, no, no romance. I am not interested. And I don't think that he would even care about Captain America and Agent Carter, except for that Agent Carter is so super duper cool, you know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Sons who are, who are grown, they're, they're men now. Um, they like my books. And that's a nice compliment. Yes. Yeah. My, my youngest son serves in the Navy and he went, he stayed, he's stationed in Japan and he hiked up Mount Fuji and he had his picture taken with him reading my book at the top of Mount Fuji. Wow. <laughs> really sweet. <laughs> Extra po bonus points for him, right? <laughs> <laughs> now that leads to another question. So you still have family uh, serving in the military. Do you think you'll do a contemporary series? Um, not at this moment. I don't know if I have a contemporary voice. Um, I almost think to write contemporary, well, especially romance, because my heart just keeps drifting toward romance. I, I'm always looking for the love story. And I think to write a contemporary romance, you really have to be young and hip and have that you know, the voice, um, you know, really have the lingo down. And I'm not young and hip anymore. So <laughs> remind me daily. <laughs> so, so I think my, my voice works better for historical fiction. Um, Though I could possibly go into more of a women's fiction, um, you know, straight fiction with a contemporary slant. Right. Right now, I keep getting ideas for World War II, and um, I've kind of built my, they tell us to build our brand, and my brand is built around World War II. I publish lots of history posts. I do Today in World War II History on my blog, which then I post to Facebook and Twitter, and I'm known as a World War II author. So as long as that keeps selling for me and as long as I have readers, I, as long as I keep getting story ideas, I see no reason to change. Right. Oh, that's a great, that, that's a wonderful way to have it. You know, as long as you, like for me, I would, I would be thinking, how would I come up with more than one World War II story? But you have them just coming to you all the time then. I think it'd be harder with other time periods. Like World War I was very, um, much more narrow in focus. I mean, you think the trench battles and uh, there's a little bit more than that, but you really can't get too much past the trenches. And I really can't imagine telling, you know, story after story after story. But World War II, there's just so many aspects to it. And people keep saying, well, you should write a series set in the Pacific and you should write one that's purely in the home front. And have you thought about one after this, they come home? And I mean, people are always throwing ideas at me too. So. I, I don't see running out of ideas in the near future. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, it sounds like that would be a, an excellent takeaway for listeners is find a period, like if you're interested in historical, find a period that you just can't seem to get enough of it. Yeah. Or, or don't pigeon yourself. I I do know a lot of historical writers who are very careful to write in different periods. So they never write the same period 
over and over again. And they have, you know, successfully branded themselves as historical fiction authors without getting married to one time period. Um, and I think unless you have a consuming love for a single time period, that's probably a better way to go. And that way you, especially since time periods come and go in popularity. And you never know. Um, World War II seems to be hot right now. It was not when I first started writing. They didn't want World War II stories. And, you know, these things, they cycle. So if you're a little broader in your scope, you might have, you might be more adaptable to the market because the market's constantly changing. Yeah, that makes sense. That's great advice. Thank you. Now, you said that you also teach historical fiction classes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I, um, my first question is, are any of them online or are they all in person? And how could people find you and, and uh, find out more about them? Well, I've done, um, t I do two different workshops. I do them at writers' conferences. So at West Coast Christian Writers, at Mount Hermon Christian Writers Conference, at American Christian Fiction Writers. There's another one. But I, I have two that I, I teach over and over again. My historical research for fiction writers is, is my um, meat and potatoes one. I keep coming back to people really like it. It's it's horribly dry as far as I'm concerned because I'm talking about, the, you know, the how do you do it, and then where can you turn for resources without being specific? Because my World War II researchers resources are not going to help somebody writing a Revolutionary War story, but more how do you find what you need to find. And then what's really, what people really like is how to organize that material because you get all this stuff and you end up with pieces of paper all over the place and emails that you've saved and how do you organize it? And you're like, I know I read that somewhere and you're trying to find it. So I've worked out a system and that seems to be the most, the biggest takeaway I get. People are coming up to me years later, oh, I still use your system, Sarah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, even with my superhero stories, I'm just like, okay, I need to find a better way to um, not only collate the information and keep it all together, but then to be able to immediately find the one thing that I was trying to ask myself. You really have to, and I, I keep telling people, it, you know, it takes five minutes to organize it well, and that's so much better than taking an hour, two or more, trying to find that information. So. Sometimes I'm in a rush, like, oh, I don't feel like putting this in my bibliography and filing it. It's like, do it. Just do it because trying to find that again later will just kill me. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. This is really fun and interesting information. Thank you. <laughs> now, if people want, it sounds like there are a lot of um, resources that people might be able to um, a lot of things that you're doing that people might be able to, to use as resources. So tell us a little bit about your website, particularly where you say that you, um, you know, blog with some of this stuff that you've taken out of your books. Maybe people are just interested in World War II, or maybe they're writing something and they're like, oh, she could be a great resource. And also if there's any classes that you're teaching this year or social media you want to mention, where can people find you? Um, my website is sarahsunden.com. Sarah with, oh, here I'll just Sarah Sondin. There we go. S-A-R-A-H-S-U-N-D-I-N for everybody who's just listening. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, if you go to the blog, there on the, in the sidebar, you can click World War II articles, and that lists all the articles I've written that are World War II related. Just on the blog itself, I do post, every day I post a tidbit today in World War II history, and I'm doing 75 years ago, so I'm right now I'm in in April 1943 and I'm posting those every day and just a little tidbit with a picture and um, I post those to Facebook and Twitter also and um, and are you Sarah Sundin or Sarah Sundin author on Facebook and Twitter um, I am on Twitter I'm Sarah Sundin and on Facebook I'm Sarah Sundin well if you just put in if you type in Sarah Sundin in the search it'll it'll come up but Sarah Sundin author is the official um, page. Great. And also on Pinterest, lots of pictures of cute World War II dresses. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, yeah, I've, I've got this great blend of <laughs> the technical and the nostalgic. So. <laughs> Fun. Oh, great. Well, listen, thank you so much for being on the show. This is really interesting. And I have to say, people should read 
well, the, probably any of your books, but I just read The Sea Before Us. And as soon as I finished, you know, I wiped my eyes and then I turned the page so I could read the first chapter of the next book, which is The Air Above Us. Sky Above Us. Yes. Sky Above Us. Okay. Um, and I, of course, now I really need to know what happens to Adler. <laughs> And that comes out in early 2019. And the third book, which is called The Land Beneath Us, is Clay's story. And that comes out in early 2020. And I'm just starting that one right now. Exciting. Oh, good luck. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks again for having us. Uh, for, I'm sorry, for, <laughs> for being on the show with us. And uh, we'll just have to keep up with you and find out what happens next. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kitty. Mm-hmm.